What's going on guys? I hope you're all doing well. Today we're here with episode number four of the new Camera Flying Basics series and we're going to be talking about different types of cameras. This episode will be divided into two parts. First part we're going to be talking about different sensor sizes and the second part will be a comparison between mirrorless and DSLR cameras. So let's get started. So in the first two episodes, you guys probably remember me talking about different sensor sizes, how some cameras have bigger sensors and others have smaller sensors, and how some lenses are designed for full frame sensors and others designed for cropped sensors. Today we'll be discussing just that. So to start, what is a camera sensor? The type of sensor used in digital cameras is called an active pixel sensor. It contains millions of pixels organized in a grid-like fashion and each pixel contains a pinned photodiode and one or more active transistors. The most common type of sensor used in cameras is called a CMOS sensor. CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor and this is the type of sensor used in phones, action cameras, mirrorless cameras and DSLRs. CMOS sensors are overlaid with color filters that cover each pixel. These filters are usually red, blue and green and they are arranged in this form, it's called the Bayer Filter Array. There are twice as many green pixels compared to blue or red to better mimic the greater sensitivity and resolution of the human eye to green light. This results in four different images that when combined together create a color image. You're probably wondering, but how can three colors create a colored image? It's simple. Our eyes are very bad at distinguishing color because we only have three color sensitive receptors. These three receptors are sensitive to short, medium and long wavelengths of visible electromagnetic radiation. Our brains are super smart and they can calculate that if two receptors are being stimulated, it means that the wavelength is somewhere in between the range of both those receptors. Let's take a look at an example. If both our long and medium wavelength receptors are being stimulated, our brain will calculate that the color is something in between. In this case, it will result in a yellowish green. This anatomy class was just to explain that monitors don't need to display the whole range of, wave of visible light wavelength in order to fool our eyes just needs to display the four colors that the senses receive. In order to create the different colors, our monitors only regulate the intensity of each LED, therefore creating all the visible light spectrum. Keep in mind that your OLED display works the opposite way a CMOS sensor displays. A CMOS sensor only captures three wavelengths, and an OLED monitor only emits three wavelengths, and both use the buyer pattern. If your screen lights up the green and red LEDs, you will see a yellow color. If both red and blue LEDs light up, we will have a magenta color. Magenta is a very interesting color because it was created by humans. By mixing long and short wavelengths together, our eyes started to see that new color, which is magenta. This is why magenta is not on the rainbow. If all LEDs light up, we will have white. The individual number of photo detectors on a sensor will determine its resolution. A sensor with 6000 by 4000 pixels will have about 24 megapixels of resolution. On the other hand, if a sensor has 9000 by 6000 pixels, it will have a resolution of 54 megapixels. More resolution means you're going to be able to see more detail, but this comes at a cost. If both the 24 and the 54 megapixel sensors have the same area, the 54 megapixel sensor will have much smaller pixel area. As I mentioned in episode 2, a smaller pixel area means that less photons will hit that pixel, which will create a darker image, therefore making that pixel less sensitive to light. With less light sensitivity on the pixels, we will have worse ISO performance. Therefore, to get a clean image, we would have to use lower ISO numbers and, as a consequence, slower shutter speeds, getting a worse blurry image. This is why GoPros and phones have such bad low light performances because they are fitted with tiny sensors that have tiny pixel area. To combat this, we can just increase the sensor size. More sensor area means more space to fit more and bigger pixels. A bigger sensor means a bigger shutter mechanism, a bigger mirror and a bigger pentaprism for the SLR cameras. We also need a bigger processor to handle all those pixels and a bigger battery to support all the other aspects. We borrowed the 3 by 2 dimensions off of 35mm film and created 35mm sensors. These are called full frame sensors. To make cameras cheaper, camera manufacturers also designed 22mm sensors called APS-C or crop sensors. APS stands for active pixel sensor and the C stands for cropped. There are also other crop sensors like Micro Four Thirds, but we will only be focusing on Canon and Sony crop sensors for this video. A crop sensor will have a number called the crop factor, 
This is how much smaller that sensor is compared to a full frame sensor. For instance, a full frame sensor is 1.6 times bigger than an APS-C size sensor. This is important to take into consideration when picking lenses. If you have a crop sensor camera, you have to multiply your lens's focal length by the crop factor in order to get the full frame equivalent. This means that a 10mm lens on a crop sensor would actually look like a 16mm lens on full frame. This is especially important on skydiving because we use wide-angle lenses and for full frame wide-angle lenses are very expensive because they use a lot of very distortive glass. If you have a crop sensor camera, there is no point in buying full frame glass because you're not going to be using the whole width of the lens. And also because wide, wide angle lenses for crop sensors are way cheaper than the same width for full frame because we use way less glass. For a full frame camera, an 11 to 24 millimeter lens is extremely expensive and only Canon manufactures it. On the other hand, a 10 to 22 millimeter for crop sensor is much cheaper. But keep in mind that a 10 to 22 millimeter on crop sensor would actually look like a 16 to 35 millimeter on a full frame camera. But even with a less wide lens, a 16 to 35 for full frame is still way more expensive than a 10 to 22 for crop sensors, even though they have the same field of view. Well, how can you tell if your camera is full frame or crop sensor? Well, Google it. But the short answer is, if you don't know whether you have a crop sensor or a full frame camera, you probably have a crop sensor. Full frame cameras are expensive and therefore you should only get into them if you are really serious about photography. The investment that comes attached to full frame cameras and full frame lenses is huge. Remember that lenses designed for crop sensors do not work on full frame. The opposite, however, does work. You can fit a full frame lens on a crop sensor camera. This is a recommendation, especially for people planning on progressing in their photography career purchasing full frame lenses and a crop sensor and eventually selling the crop sensor and buying a full frame body while maintaining the same lenses. This is a very smart way to invest your money in photography. But keep in mind that in skydiving you might lose and you might damage your lenses, so keep that in mind. So, what are some other differences between full frame and crop? Well, aperture is also reduced on crop sensor cameras. To get the equivalent aperture of a full frame lens on a crop, you must multiply it by 1.6 as well. This means, again, that to get the same light on crop sensors as you would on full frame, you have to get a wider aperture, therefore getting a shallower depth of field, which for skydiving isn't ideal, as I mentioned in episode 2. So, what should we choose for skydiving? In my opinion, crop sensors are more than enough for skydiving's purposes. Most items or fun jobs you're going to be filming and shooting are going to be posting those pictures onto social media, which means that getting a lot of resolution is not too important. Also, during most jumps, we have a lot of natural available light, so getting a super light sensitive sensor is also not too important. Finally, the deal breaker, in my opinion, is the price of lenses. Wide angle lenses for full frame cameras are super expensive. So, if you damage your full frame camera system, you're going to be out thousands of euros just on your camera body and just on your lens alone. So if you damage or lose your full frame camera system, you're going to be out way more money than if it was a crop sensor, wide lens and body combination. With this being said, a professional photographer that will have their images printed in huge canvases will see benefits in full frame cameras. But for the amateur photographer, an APS-C size sensor is more than enough to get faster speeds and nice and sharp images. One last note, there is something called the speed booster, which is an adapter for mirrorless APS-C sized cameras that basically magnifies the size of the sensor in order to mimic full frame. This is by far the best upgrade you can make to your Canon or Sony mirrorless APS-C camera. And I highly recommend it, but I won't talk about it a lot in this video. We will cover it in a future episode. But if you are looking to invest in good lenses and just want to get a cheap APS-C sized body, I would definitely recommend getting super good sharp full frame glass then getting a speed booster and an APS-C sized camera and eventually when you do build up your professional career get into the full frame cameras and still have usable lenses. Again, do keep in mind that a speed booster only takes full frame lenses. If you have any questions or complimentary information you would like to add, you can do so freely in the comment section down below and as always, have a good day.